Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Fighting on Film. This week we are covering Men in War a 1957 Korean war film starring Aldo Ray and Robert Ryan. It follows a platoon-sized element of uh, a US infantry unit, which finds itself inadvertently behind enemy lines Mm -hmm. uh, after a uh, North Korean Chinese offensive, which has apparently obliterated forward elements. Just North Korean in 1950. Is it 50? Is that when it's set? Yeah. 6th of September 1950, it says on the starting title screen. Oh, fuck me, I didn't even see that. Okay. <laughs> so this unit was going to the hill to reinforce them and take supplies, etc. And mm. with that offensive, they've kind of like found themselves stuck behind enemy lines and their, their vehicle is uh, beyond repair. You know, they, they've come into some trouble because their their truck is sort of up on its, you know, it's stuck on a sort of a the start of a ditch. So it looks like they yeah. might have been hit by something and there's like a, there's an armored vehicle on fire on top of like a ridge as well. I couldn't yeah. make out what it was. I don't know whether you could. I wasn't sure what it was. I thought it might have been a half track. Yeah, it looked SPG ish. Yeah, or it might, yeah, it might have been something like that. The film follows this unit as they try to reach that hill, not knowing because they can't reach anyone on, on the radio. It basically just follows their progress towards this hill yeah. uh, until we get a climax. It's very sort of simple plot where the men are going from A to B and then there's an attack at the end. The movie concentrates more on the men as people and sort of how they've been affected by the combat we don't see at the start, how they've been affected and how yeah. Benson's trying really hard to keep everyone's morale up and keep everyone moving. You know, you know, I think he even says at the start of the movie. The quote is, in this war, you're either healthy or you're dead. That's it. Which is probably one of the best lines of the whole film, really. Yeah, the other good line is when um, Aldo Ray's character gets stopped in his Jeep and he goes, where do you think you are? Times Square? (laughs) (laughs) Quite a good one. And the guys that are um, involved are from the 24th Infantry Division. Um, Their patch is quite prevalently shown in most shots. But as you say, I think the the title of the film is pretty descriptive. It's Men in War. Mm. And it... This film does kind of try and make a, a little bit more of a, an effort to portray sort of like combat stress, perhaps. You know, there's a couple of people who've got shell shock. There's people dealing with the situation in various different ways. Mm. There's a, an NCO which, who's a little bit shaken, a little bit flaky. And also, I mean, the main characters are uh, uh, Aldo Ray's character, Montana, and Robert Ryan's character, Lieutenant Benson. It's those two characters that sort of carry the, the narrative of the film. Yeah. And they play off each other quite well. When we first introduced to them, it's obvious that Aldo Ray's character has been through quite a lot. You know, he's got like a thousand yard stare and the colonel that he's with is, is mute pretty much throughout the whole movie. And it's implied that, you know, he says, you know, he's sick in the head. So it's it's implied he's got some sort of shell shock or, he, or he's seen some horrible stuff. I think it mentions a mine went off near him. That's it, yeah. So, mm. so you know, he's, he's a bit dazed still. You know, they're trying to get these guys back and Montana doesn't want to help, but he has to to get the colonel back which is his overarching goal he has to help benson there's a a squad attack at the end that they attack a bunker and it it just goes completely wrong which was very different i think to what i was expecting i think that's where the film tries to be a little bit different again from other films of its era Mm. where it tries to show something a little bit more perhaps perhaps not realistic but perhaps more um authentic i don't know whether that's that's the correct the right word for it either. gritty more, more a gritty end grisly end possibly yeah i, I think know. it's trying to show something that might be a little closer to the reality of war not everyone survives an attack yeah um not every not every operation goes to plan and i think that's what the screenplay of the movie is trying to get at yeah i think i think you're right because um you know if you haven't seen this movie at the end spoiler alert but only benson and ray sorry montana and um benson survive Maybe one of their corporals might survive as well. Yeah, I think I think so. Someone does appear at the end. Yeah. Also, not knowing who that corporal is kind of speaks to the how the rest of the cast in the film are used. 
we don't really get any sort of like sense of who they are other than brief moments. You could make a, a play for, you know, it's men in war. It's just men in war, <laughs> unfortunately. That might be an, an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the cast. Mm. Robert Ryan, who Foff fans, Foff listeners might know from Marine Raider or Longest Day, he played Jim Gavin in it. Um, so you probably know him from that if you don't know him from any of his other work. Um, Aldo Ray, he was in uh, the Green Berets. Yeah, he was. And you have a young Vic Moreau and fans of the 60s TV series Combat will know him as Sergeant Chip Saunders. He's quite an integral part in that. But he's, mm-hmm. he's very young in this. Um, and I think he actually does a good job uh, of what he's got to do. And then Robert Keith, and he plays the Colonel. And that's the only real people of any merit. It's funny because throughout the film, uh, Benson, Ryan's character, uses a notebook to sort of uh, list off the names of his men. Mm -hmm. As you're watching it, you kind of feel like you would also need a notebook just to keep track of who is supposed to be in this platoon. Whereas a guy commanding a, a platoon would know all of his men. Mm. He wouldn't need a notebook to like flip through and go. Because some of them, don't they? they have little moments, you know, how they, they mention his leadership. But mm. I, I just couldn't, I found it hard to sort of care. Spoilers again, but when they get a lot of them get gunned down at the end, I didn't really have a lot of emotion for them. No. And that kind of undermines, I think, the aim of the film a little bit. Because we're supposed to think about these men in war. Mm. and you know the difficult situations they're finding themselves in and everyone's very tired and war weary and the only person who adds any sort of pizzazz or panache to to the proceedings is ray because he he has a lot of things to do i quite like um staff sergeant uh killian who's played by james edwards okay he's the the black nco which is interesting in itself because obviously it's a rel- relatively rare portrayal of you know the the post segregated U.S. Army because yeah, the U.S. Were. Army desegregated in forty nine. Yes, but a lot of the films um, that Hollywood put out after that didn't really kind of get the memo. No, they didn't. Partially because a lot of them were World War Two movies and segregation was still in you know yeah, in effect very true. at that point. But also because you know it just it, it, they don't seem to have you know been interested in that kind of representation so i like james edwards's character in that and i think i think killian's character is good you know he has some nice scenes with vic moreau yeah he's shown to be very caring towards him he's a quality nco in that he's looking after his men mm. and he has an easy style he dies far too soon into the in, into he does. for me mm. and the, the other part of the plot is they're being stalked by north korean infiltrators and that they mm. sneaking up on them taking them out one by one I know the the director, Anthony Mann, we'll talk about production in a bit, but he was known for making Western films. So at a time I was like, this is like the wagon train being taken out one by one. You could easily switch out uh, North Koreans for Apaches and yeah. the, the soldiers for US cavalry. You know, it's it, you could definitely do it. Anthony Mann's back catalogue is lots of really good, solid Westerns, lots of them with James Stewart. And the heroes of Telemark. And here is a telemark as well, which we can, I'm sure we'll talk about when we get to the production bit in a moment. He's a solid director. Mm. This and here, here is a telemark are his only war movies. Yeah, they are. I think they are. Yeah. And here is a telemark is a far superior movie. Oh, it is. Yeah. You can tell he learned a lot from this. The thing with the espionage element of here is a telemark is it kind of draws on his background in noir films. Yes. He was basically known for Westerns and noir movies. And you, you, it comes through, you know, you with uh, Robert Ryan's character, he, you, you could see him as like a grizzled PI, like post-war sort of thing. He's got that look. Mm. He, he does look really good in his gear. I must admit, most of the lads in it, they do look great in their gear. Um, they're believable as soldiers, I think, personally. Yeah. Ray, maybe not. I don't think he's miscast. I just think he's playing a different, play, he's not playing a soldier. He's playing someone who wants, who wants to get out of there. Mm but he also is shown to be a good soldier. So it's a bit of an odd character there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a hard, it's a hard one to sort of judge because it's, it's not, there's a lot to go on, but then there's periods in the movie where there's just not a lot's going on. It's like you said earlier, it's a road movie. It does feel like a road movie. So they're progressing towards their end destination and there's little set pieces that happen throughout. So there's 
uh, an artillery barrage, which is a weird scene. Yeah. Like there's, a, there's an art, there's an artillery barrage, which is sort of blocking the road. And it's incredibly zeroed into that little road. Yeah. And it's very narrowly zeroed in. Yeah. They only fire three round salvos and Benson gets his pocketbook out and sends his men through piecemeal. Which is really weird. I don't think that's how that would have been handled. And there's some sort of arbitrary reason why they're shooting like that. And and Robert Ryan says, "Oh, there's a re- there's a reason why they're shooting three rounds." And you're like, "What? They just stonk you, mate." That scene doesn't work for me. No. There's another scene where there's a a, mi- a minefield, and there's all those North Korean infiltrator attacks that sort of like stop the column. Those scenes are good. I like those bits. Hmm. Although I think it's weird that none of them have have rifles. No, they don't. They actually say in the film they're short on rifles, but they've got plenty of men. Yeah, that's not which right. is true, but not that true. Like they, anyone that had infiltrated that far in would be armed. Mm. And there seems to be that one of my issues with the movie is there's only coordination of the enemy when the plot needs it. Yeah. So much of the time, these infiltrators are attacking the column with you know just bayonets. Or little, little daggers or something. Yeah, and it's ones and twos. Mm. But you ne- and then you never really see any coordination, and it's just a bit weird. I, it, that's just something probably to the average viewer that wouldn't be an issue. But to me, I'm like, yeah, this is really piecemeal. Why are they why are they doing it like this? Like, do, are they really attacking just for their the to steal their weapons? But then some shots they're clearly like they could clearly be seen from like every ridge line around the establishing shots, and I'm like. You just called an artillery strike in. We'd set an MG up, and you'd lay waste to them all, and you'd move on. Yes, exactly. They're very much used on the, as you said, when the plot needs them to be. Um, there's there's definite plot holes there as is. well. Yeah, and that actually might be answered in the in the production. It was released by United Artists, um, as we said, as we mentioned, directed by Anthony Mann, who later went on to direct the fantastic Hero of Telemark. He also did El Cid and The Fall of the Roman Empire, which are you know, pretty epic movies. Definitely. So he was, he was a big director by, by the 60s. It's adapted from a book called Day Without End, which is a World War II novel. Um, and uh, me and Matt think possibly, you know, updating it to Korea was to be more topical around the time the film was released and maybe sort of make it stand out from Second World War films. I think so. I think that makes sense. Because um, I believe the, the book it was based on was sort of like set in normandy mm. i don't see the parallels but no i wonder how this would have worked if it was set in normandy yeah it would have been a bit odd but but i mean it, it it certainly works as a korean war movie yeah it works more i think more so mm. i think i think as we said earlier like the the way that man handles the north koreans yeah mirrors sort of the periods westerns I don't think that would have quite worked as you know with germans the germans would be everywhere surely sort of thing Maybe people aren't as aware. I mean, it would have been interested as a movie set in the Bacage. Yeah, that might ah, that might have been good. Yeah, that would that would have been interesting. Been interesting. It's like a, like a lost platoon mm. trying to. But I mean, the Bacage wasn't that big, so they'd have to be really lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, all you have to do is like head west. Yeah, and you would get back to, to your you own know, lines, Allied lines, wouldn't you? Mm. The other interesting thing is this film had no help from the Pentagon. So the, the US Army didn't like the representation of men in it. And I've got a, a quote from the army uh, why they didn't like it. They said, it would offend the dignity of commissioned and non-commissioned officers. So yeah, they didn't help with props, didn't help with extras, no tanks, nor anything like that. No technical assistance whatsoever. They famously were quite forthcoming with, with helping with movies. Yeah, the, the, the US Army of, of the, the 50s, 60s were hot on like any kind of, you know, anything they could assist with Hollywood wise that made them look good. They were they were definitely up for it. The, then the, the script had to be altered when that happened. So the, the, the director and his cinematographer, they concentrate on the scenery um, more. So it was filmed in Bronson Canyon, which is in Hollywood. MASH was filmed there, I think you were, you were telling me earlier. Yeah. It was made for just under a million dollars and it made only 500,000 domestically, but internationally it made 2 million. So it, it didn't do too badly. The music was also by uh, Elmer Bernstein. He's a really famous composer. He is. The theme song at the end is quite rousing, isn't it? Men in war, 
Man. Yeah, I, I hate <laughs> it. Yeah, scary, um, like. <laughs> it's it's, uh, I, it's exactly what you don't need at the end of this film. You know, we start off the film with a really stark sort of like title image of some uh, line drawings of grizzled soldiers with thousand yard stares, and then we end it with like how the West was won or like <laughs> a early fifties like terrible Western yeah. theme song. It could be like from Annie, couldn't it? So not Annie. Yeah, Annie it's that, there's there's a certain type of of Western film that had those type of songs at the end of them, and this is exactly the kind of film that didn't need it. No, it's it just doesn't work for me. I don't think we've had a film that is stark. The ending is probably unexpected to what most Quite bleak, cinema yeah. goers would have you know expected. Um, Robert Ryan and and Ray are basically exhausted at the end of this movie there's a poignant scene at the end which is a little kitsch but it's poignant yeah and then it sort of flows into this sort of weird western movie theme song i mean i guess it's so they could sell sell it on vinyl i have no idea how that worked back then maybe yeah no i've seen i've seen pictures when i was researching there's pictures of the, the soundtrack on vinyl Okay, okay. So maybe they wanted a, a song to, to sort of build it around. Fair enough. This Men, men War soundtrack hit now available in the lobby. Definitely would not have bought that one, but you know. That's... <laughs> no. Any self respecting um, connoisseur would not be wanting Men in War in their collection. <laughs> so the screenplay is interesting too, the story around the screenplay. Uh, it was credited to uh, Philip Jordan, mm. who's quite a well known uh, screenwriter. Yeah. But it's believed it was actually written by uh, a chap that was blacklisted, Ben Maddow. And he's blacklisted for being basically too left wing. So we have that whole sort of uh, McCarthyism sort of vibe going on. And he was was blacklisted and wrote numerous fairly Mm well-known films, was quite prolific. And Jordan and a few other people were sort of the front for him. It's quite interesting, isn't it? All that McCarthyism, blacklisting and all that. It kind of divided Hollywood along yeah, it did. political lines for a while, didn't it? Maybe that's one of the reasons the army wouldn't help for this movie. Maybe they got weight from up top. Who knows? I, there's no, there's literally no way of knowing. I mean, the, the army may have had some idea, but who knows? Who knows? It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, Matt, regale us with your alley tally this week. There's a lot of kit in this movie. There's a lot of kit. One of the first things I spotted was M1 carbines with bayonets. That's cool. It, it does look good. There's a lovely shot at the start, a guy like covering the, the ridge line. Mm, and he's he's letting rip with, a, with it at sort of like hip level. Yes. It's just a really, that's a really beautiful shot, yeah. actually. There's some really nice cinematography, which I'll, I'll get to later on. Mm. There's a few little bits in, in the film with kit that are really interesting. So you've got an M9 bazooka, which you don't see too often, um, which is a, a nice inclusion that sort of like pays off at the end. Yep. Um, there's a BAR. There is. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure because you don't really see that BAR until the very end of the movie. No, you don't. It just sort of appears, isn't it? I'm not entirely sure that it is uh, an M1919A2 because the close-ups that we do get we see the fore end, and it's got the original M1918 World War One era um, BAR mm-hmm. fore end. So it's quite quite noticeably different. So it's chunkier, it's taller, and it has sort of knurling on the wooden surface. Yeah, that's yeah. Whereas yeah, the World War Two era uh, M1919, sorry M1918 A2, has more of a, a, a scalloped lower profile. Ostensibly, it looks like an, an A2. It's got the bipod, it has the, the, the flash hider. But then the rate of fire from the BAR seemed a little high. Mm. I mean, that, that could have been because it was running blanks. I don't know. Maybe. It might have been you know, altered by an armor. But it, it just there's just that and the fore end made me think, oh, that's, that's an original M1918 playing the role of an A2, mm. which I thought was you know, kind of interesting. There's some really good weapon close-ups at the end. Really nice ones. Yeah, yeah. There's some surprising stuff as well. So, you know, you have uh, Ray ends up with a Japanese Type 99 light machine gun. 
that not a lot of Chicon weapons, like no SKSs, all things like that. No, but there was a PPSH Papa Shah 41. Yeah, there was. That was nice to see. Blink and you'll miss it sort of thing. That is an iconic weapon of the Korean War. It is. Yeah, definitely. So they were lucky to find that. But you're kind of thinking, why didn't we see more of that? And there's no Mosins as well. The um, North Korean sniper has a Gewehr 98. Mm. So they're obviously stand-ins for Mosins. Um, but it didn't really jar me. I thought I knew what they were going for. And then obviously at the end, the um, the North Korean machine gunners have a, a Vickers gun. Which Robert Ryan has a nap on. He does. It must be really uncomfortable that. I was like, what's he doing? Use a sandbag, mate. What are you doing? But that's obviously meant to be a Maxim gun. Yeah, I, I would assume so, like a PM1910 or something like that, perhaps. It's just nice to see it. It's nice to see a Vickers gun. There's a surprising plethora of kit, though. It's quite enjoyable on the kit side of things. Yeah, I took a screenshot um, at 4 minutes 51, if any of you've got the, the DVD. The Dodge that's been broken, it's not been blown up, but it's it's in a... I don't know. He, the, um, Kenyon is underneath it at the beginning, isn't he? And he says, like, the drive the drive shaft's shot. So maybe they hit a mine? Yeah, I took a screenshot of all the kit in the back. So you've got combat meal individual boxes, um, like ration boxes, sea rat boxes. Oh, cool. Um, you've got what looks to be like the tripod for the 30 cal men's haversacks, ammunition boxes. Yeah. The M2 flamethrower that turns up later on, that's in there. Yeah, you've got the M9 bazooka, the rocket launcher. Yeah, that's in its, it's in its sort of disconnected state. The BARs slung on the sea there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we're we're to, to to the listener. We're currently looking at this picture. Me and Matt. We're going to have to branch out into um, screen caps from film analysis because <laughs> I hear I hear photo analysis is really popular it's, right it's, now. It's all the rage, Matt. It's all the rage, and um, the kids love it. I was like, oh, there's your alley, Sally, right there. There's that nice sweeping shot at the back of the Dodge. Literal Dodge full of alley. Alley Dodge. It's new. The Dodge Alley. Get all good dealerships. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so yeah that's my alley tally this week the, the movie sort of it has a lot of kit but then it has extremely minimal action she went on an gym with a bedford full of really nice alley brick oh, kit now don't tease us Matt. <laughs> don't tease us anything else you'd like to add when it comes to sort of like kit like the the uniforms seem okay we've got like a mix of like US Marine Corps covering on the helmets. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's and then some nets. That's very accurate. But then there's there's weird like um, NCO markings on the helmets, which yeah. I've never ever seen anything like that in photographs. That's a very film thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's kind of like what you would imagine toy soldiers to have like <laughs> painted on the helmets. Yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, like the the NCO rank chevrons, and I just like I was I thinking that's really weird, and Robert Ryan's character. Is absolutely plastered in insignia. Mm-hmm. So he's wearing his um, combat infantryman uh, rifle, cross rifles yeah. badge. He's got the combat infantryman badge. He's basically he's he's way down. Got so much reflective insignia on him. You you wonder how the North Koreans didn't spot them earlier. That's very very true. Um, yeah, that is true. But no one else seems to have. No. It's all very basic. I think it's much. It's very basic. I mean, he looks he looks very off like war, like war weary officer. You know, he's got his mm. binoculars case. He's got a musette bag, um, right, like big have a sack thing on his shoulder. He's got proper carbine webbing on, which you don't see very often. That was nice. But then you know the carryover from from World War Two to Korea is very very slim. There's there's you know there's not really much new kit introduced for the Korean War. Very true. Yeah. We also see Ray with uh, like a cavalry, quite a large cavalry patch. The colonel's got one too. Mm, makes sense. Same unit. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier it might have been first cav. Might have been. Um, but I did wonder whether by the Korean War they'd introduced such large sort of like unit it's patches. Huge. Or whether that was sort of a post-war thing and it was just whatever they could get their hands on. Yeah, because obviously the, you know, said before, but they <laughs> they haven't got any help. So if they get it wrong, maybe they wouldn't know. As you said earlier, the the rest of the platoon is twenty fourth inth div. Yeah, they are. So they have a they have the little insignia, mm. and that looks about the right size. Yeah, it looks for right. A, I mean, they were fighting. Back, apparently, back. they were fighting early early Korean War anyway, so it isn't out of place. Mm-hmm. Um, on the on the beat back to Pusan, I don't think anything was inherently wrong. I mean, some of the Korean gear is a bit cobbled together. Yeah, like a bandolier with with round, rifle rounds in it, yeah. and they haven't got a rifle. Yeah, it's a bit odd. Slapdash. Mm. 
It's possible. The kitten, it's possible. Don't forget to mention when Ray guns that guy down and he goes, why did you shoot him? He was unarmed. And he goes, oh, the, the, the communists have pistols in their caps. They get out a little, cute little pistol from the guy, from the dead. Yeah, like a little little uh, CZ-25 yeah. or something, like a 25 ACP pocket pistol. It's proper, like, it's one of those proper, sh- like, you only get these sort of shots in, in older films where someone, clearly not the actor's hand, comes and takes the gun out of the, of the, the, the helmet and shows it to the camera. It's a detail shot as well, isn't it? It's a super close up, really nice like shot of the of the gun. It would be like, you know, in if because obviously man directs noir films, you could just see sort of PI going, look, I found the weapon that the murderer used. And he like pulls it out of like a, a drawer or something, like to mm-hmm. present it to the camera. It seems that sort of technique. What have you got for fave scenes, Robbie? <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about mine first because Matt this week isn't sure um, for the first time in a while. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. Yeah, Matt's not sure. I've got a favourite bit. So towards the end of the film, they attack the MG position. So it goes wrong. Everyone sort of forgets how to... It's sort a fucking of... shambles, Robbie. You, you understand <laughs> it, but yes, <laughs> it fucking, does go wrong. It's a fucking shambles. Everyone forgets that you don't just run out into, into like no cover. You're going to get gunned down. They're all very, oh, we got to save the lieutenant. He's been shot. And then they go to run to get him, but they just run it out in the open and get gunned down. Everyone. Yes. Everyone yeah, dies. Repeatedly. Uh, well, the colonel gets killed. He tries to help um, and has this sort of moment of clarity where he's decided he's just going to go and walk up the hill for Thompson. Yeah, he just charges up the hill with, with the Thompson, which is an M1928A1, not an M1A1. Yes. So it's got the cocking handle on the top. So that's interesting that it's uh, an older Thompson. Yeah, it is. I think they were still kicking about. Oh God, yeah, they were probably kicking about, but I think by that point they'd moved mostly onto M1A1s and M3 grease guns by that point. Colonel's dead, and it's just Montana and, and um, Benson. Loggerheads the whole movie, they don't see eye to eye, and they share a, a lucky strike. They psych themselves up to go and get the, the last bit of the bunker, and then they just come across the, the flamethrower that's just been left on the ground, and there's a convenient box of grenades next to it, so... Montana puts on the the, the flamethrower, gets ready, and, and and Benson loads up with grenades, and then they they go and take out the the pillbox, which is quite funny because they're shooting at it with the flamethrower, but it doesn't set fire or anything like that massively, even though they're shooting like a jet. Of... It doesn't seem to reach it for the first it couple no. of spurts, does it? I was going to say that, yeah, and then it explodes, goes up like a bonfire. Ryan throws a couple of hand grenades in, doesn't he? Mm, and then you know, there's another MG position that's shooting at them but can't be seen which I was like, well, that's wrong. <laughs> Where the hell are they shooting them from? Because <laughs> it's very <laughs> odd. Um, fans of the Twitter will, we, we watched an awful D-Day film a few weeks back and we were like, where where are the Germans shooting from on a ridgeline? Because they're firing forward, but they're below them. It's quite, it was weird. It's a little- that, that film was quite possibly the, the worst thing I've ever watched. <laughs> it's very odd. Oh God, honestly. We're going to have to cover it. I know we I are. I think we're going to have to. We're going to have to. So they take out the they take out the, the the little bunker thing, and then Benson throws some some grenades, and and that's the end of the film. But I liked it because it it showed the two men coming together. Mm. You know that they buried the hatchet, and they were like, right, we've got to yeah. we've got to go and take out the enemy now. But that was it for me. So that, just com- coming off that that final attack is a classic example of why NCOs are essential. True, because by the point they reach the hill, they have one corporal left. Mm-hmm. And Montana is not a helpful NCO. He doesn't want to be involved. He only reluctantly goes into the battle when the colonel sort of leads the way. But we just want one corporal left to coordinate an entire sort of squad. It's 12 men at that point. Because and the corporal that is with them is clearly suffering shell shock or something. He's not combat effective. Exactly. And Benson foolishly insists on attacking the first North Korean defensive position on his own. Mm and just leaving his men to do what he wants so that he's not coordinating the assault. He plans it fairly well. He has um, a couple of machine guns giving supporting fire. Yep. He's going to attack the first pillbox and then a supporting element will sweep up the hill. That's what he's planning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's all sort of synchronised to watches. But as soon as like the plan falls apart... There doesn't seem to be a plan B. Their, their plan just seems... No, the, it, it's completely ridiculous. So with, without any NCOs controlling them, they basically just decide to do what they want. They either stop firing, giving covering fire, mm. or they run out and, and try and 
help wounded people who have already run out. So the the entire assault becomes a shambles, and ninety five percent of the the attacking force is wiped out unnecessarily. I had an issue with the. They've got a really nice shot of, of Vic Moreau's character shooting the bazooka. It looks like a live round, I think. Yeah, it's pretty convincing. It's, it, yeah. That is one of my favourite parts, and I will mention that in a minute. But it annoys me how he's just seen shooting at some random piece of rock, not firing it at the bunker, which probably that would just take one round and it'd be, it'd be up in flames. Yeah, they're sandbag bunkers, like a... Sorry to steal your thunder there. Not at all. Like a single rocket launcher round would have knocked out that position. One of the things about the final climactic sequence is it's underwhelming. So mm. the the huge amount of build that the, the rest of the film gives is kind of like, oh, okay. Mm. I'm not saying it's inaccurate though. No, it's I no. mean, it's, it's a squad with no NCOs. So the command and control of, an, of a fairly complex attack mm. broken down. So that's relatively, you know, realistic and, you know, men would have panicked and, you know, gone and tried to help other people. It just shows that Ryan's a really poor officer or Benson, Mm. Ryan's character is a pretty poor officer. Should have been coordinating that attack and had someone else move forward to attack the the bunker. Yeah, well, he goes off on his own, doesn't he? He straps a, a field dress into his back so they can tell who he is, I assume. Which is absolute crap as well. Like, I didn't quite understand that. No, um, you'd know you'd know exactly what he looked like. They weren't far literally away. Literally two hundred yards away, and you can see who is who. Really weird. And it's on like a on like a fairly steep hill. There's not going to be that many North Koreans running around. No. It's there's no scrub. No, and he you know he gets shot in the hand, and then they go, oh, yeah. the, the lieutenant's been shot. Let's go and help him. Yeah. So the 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 Brown in thirty cal stops firing the main weapon that's <laughs> yeah. covering the attack. Yeah stops firing and then they just run out into like open ground and get killed it's there because it wants you to go oh my god look at them all they're getting killed and i sort of did mm-hmm. do that i was like hang on whoa hang on you're kidding all you cast off it yeah it's it's weak but uh, it, it's intentionally weak i think because the enemy is quite faceless that they're not poised as like the big bad communist enemy which is quite actually quite refreshing for a, a, a movie of that time you know they're not yeah you barely see them yeah you see you see some skulking there's no political element to the fighting in the communists, the communists, which is quite rare. No, there, there's some interesting lines from from Ryan where he's he's talking about this war is going to be never ending, and you know it, what kind of person do we need to win this war? Yeah, do we need someone who is completely unhinged? Even though the war's already war? ended by the time the war movie comes out. Well, obviously, 1957. It's been over for a few years. For that, if it had come out in 1952, I'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, if it come out during, that it would have been like, wow. Yeah, that's okay. what I mean. Like, some of the lines don't... I wonder if it was written during the time. Yeah, the screenplay could have been. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Oh, you've got the whole bit with the with the medals and... Oh. The part where he's throwing silver stars that the colonel had brought to decorate his men with is a little weird. It's odd. It's an odd end. Mm. He sort of feels like, oh, the colonel never got to award these to his to his men it's implied that all the men that got killed in this absolute bungled attack are worthy of silver stars and and they throw it into the ravine and ray says what about the colonel and benson doesn't even like even think about including him in the list of you know men that should be decorated yeah but it's it's a little bit jarring weird isn't it it is a little bit because i thought the movie was going to end when they both passed out from exhaustion from fight and i thought that would have been a good end that would have been a yeah, decent end to the film I'd have felt for the characters, I'd have felt for the men that died. But because they wake up... Cue the men in war song. Do the men in war song, it probably worked. <laughs> it wouldn't be as jarring. You get a horrible 50s close-up of some prawns or something. They look horrible, what, what they eat for breakfast. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, it looked yeah. disgusting. It was like it was like dried sweet corn and dried shrimp. And I was just like, what the hell are they eating? Where'd they find that? Um, anyway. Must have been in the bunker. Must have been, yeah. Um, close up of food in movies always looks weird to me anyway it's just a person completely unnecessary weird yeah and they have that chat about the medals and then i'm just like well what that's a poor that's a weak ending to your film it's sort of you know i'm like well none of these guys deserve medals because they didn't do anything that heroic you know if anything ray and ryan deserve medals because they single while injured took out two mm. mg positions on their own and i'm like well they deserve the medals not not the men that yeah. ran out in front of a machine gun yeah, I, I mean, the real climax of the film is the uh, the coming together of Ray and Ryan's characters, isn't it? 
So Ray, we didn't mention it earlier, but Ray is reluctant. To, we did mention the fact that he's reluctant to help Ryan, but the reason he's reluctant is because he wants to get the Colonel back to safety. Um, yeah, he wants to go back to Busan. Yeah. But the relationship between Ray and the Colonel is is sort of father-son-esque and it's yeah. kind of clumsily handled in places. Um, a bit clunky. A little bit clunky, yeah. But they, the, the, the real sort of pinnacle of the, the climax of the film isn't the attack it's ray and ryan saying okay we'll we'll, we'll attack the hill together we'll work together mm. i think yeah it's an odd one but in terms of my favorite scenes um i don't i don't have a particular favorite scene i have favorite bits of cinematography which is about as generous as i can be so there's a couple of really nice shots and the cinematographer on the movie was a, a chap called Ernest Haller, right? Who was an Oscar-winning um, cinematographer. He won the Oscar for *Gone with the Wind*. Oh wow! So, so you can see what he came from. Um, at the very beginning of the film, there's a really nice shot of the radio op, the radio operator, with the handset in his hand. It's a half close-up of his face, so it's showing one side of his face and the handset. And he's incessantly calling for um, Battalion HQ. That's it. And it's just that incessant sort of like uh, X to X, you know, repeat X to X, come in, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got the beads of sweat in his, on his face. And... Exactly. Nice, really sort of like, it's a really tense shot. And the only movement in the whole shot is his thumb flicking the send receive lever back and forth. Yeah which is something you don't really see when people show radios and movies. And B, it's it's a really nice, really beautifully sort of like frame shot. It is. And the, the cinematography is strong. Very strong. That yeah. obviously comes down to the not having, maybe not making the movie they wanted without the Pentagon help. You know, the framing of some of the bits is lovely. You know, you see the when they're walking in into the deeper, into the sort of, canyon, you know, they've got the hills and things. It looks very much like, well, they're walking into the, the valley of the shadow of death now mm. you know it's very atmospheric there's a nice shot of benson's feet when he goes looking for uh sergeant kinian yep. who was tailing charlie and it's just his feet moving through the sand i like that of the road and it's just a really beautifully sort of like framed mm. uh medium shot of of him walking um we don't see anyone skulking we don't see the rest of robert ryan we just see his feet shuffling through the sand and calling out to the sergeant and it's another one of those tense moments that the tension's created through the cinematography even you, when you when you learn about them being cut off the way that the movie's been shot up till that point you've only seen a few men like mm -hmm. and then you see the you know it shows you the scale of where they are and i'm like oh actually yeah they are cut off you know they aren't on a front line with the visions around them they, they look pretty desperate one thing that did bother me about about the film, kind of nagged, was how empty it felt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On so, the flip side, I'll give I'll give you that definitely. It it kind of feels very empty. So they they've either been ambushed or they've hit mines, one or the other, and they know the enemy are around, but there's no sort of I don't know. They don't convey the film doesn't convey this feeling of a battle space which is inhabited by two sides. For a lot of the movie, it feels like it's just the American column moving on its own. We occasionally get some infiltrators, but we don't. I don't think it really creates that feel of constant pressure that being behind enemy yeah. lines would would convey would create. You know, it, they could have been sniped out a few times, mm. you know, on the ridge lines, or, you know, they could have had to dodge machine gun fire from being exposed themselves too much. It could have just benefited with a little bit more. I you know, I think even, you know, we're talking ahead of, of time, but even a movie like um, A Healing Career, which is a British Korean war movie, that conveys the men being in a war zone a lot more effectively than this does. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's because we see the enemy at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. So we see them, 
uh, at the outset when when the there's they've stopped in that village and then the North Koreans arrive and, and they attack and they have to they have to basically fighting retreat out of the village but the enemy and then the rest of the film the rest of that movie is just a, a fighting retreat isn't it really yeah but then the enemy in this one in men at war they just seem a little bit they're sort of secondary they're not important mm. and i think it, it, they need to be important because you're so scared of them picking you off but yet you barely see them and then at the end the whole the whole platoon is, is killed by effectively four men four, four enemy men something like that yeah, there's no feeling of those overwhelming North Korean numbers. No, there's not. And I don't they probably didn't have the budget to show it, but Exactly. And I think that is what it is. I think they didn't have the budget. They didn't have the budget to arm some of the North Koreans properly. So they were they were said to be, you know, stealing weapons, mm. etc. They could have given them carbines or or garands. It wouldn't have jarred me. I don't know what they were going for. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah, you could have narratively said, Oh, they must have captured those from the, the hill. Yeah, they could have said that. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you mentioned a hill in Korea because I think there's some real parallels between the two films. Mm. Uh, when you think about it, they're both about platoon sized elements, yeah. both about the relationship between a lieutenant and, a, and an NCO and the decisions they make to get to somewhere. And there's those little moments of set piece. But I, I think, honestly, I think a uh, hill in Korea probably does it better. No, I think it does. I think it does. I think it has a stronger plot. They're forced to go somewhere in here in healing career, whereas in this one they know where they're going. Yes, yeah, that's true. There's this sort of a thought process to healing career. Mm. They they kind of think, oh well, we'll have to go here then because there's nowhere else for us to yeah, go. Exactly. We're boxed in. That's where you get the jeopardy from. Yeah, we're going to have to make a last stand, whereas we have to get to this hill to get back to everyone else. Mm. But yet you never see the rest of their division. Like where the hell were they? Well, the thing is, why are they attacking that hill? Yeah, if they're on the hill. If they if their if their battalion position is was on that hill and the North Koreans are occupying that hill, why the hell are they attacking that hill? On their own. When there is a probably a battalion brigade sized element that has pushed the frontline battalion yeah. off the hill or wiped it out. Yeah, it's there's a lot of plot holes in it. When you think about it, Ray's character has driven away from that hill range. Yeah. His unit has been wiped out. There's no communication with Benson's unit, the larger battalion. So you've got to you've got to sort of like assume that's two US battalions that aren't operational. They've either been pushed back or completely wiped out. What good is taking a Dodge or a Jeep full of, you know, a, a few thousand rounds of, you know, 30 caliber ammo and a, and a rocket launch and a flamethrower up to a hill when you don't know if anyone's there? Yeah, and when you get there, you find out oh, there's North Koreans here. Probably shouldn't attack that with just twelve men. So yeah, I mean, if you overthink it and you think about what's what yeah, is actually it, going on in the movie, it's inherent that we can't help it with this on this pod. You know, we watch the movies yeah. a few times. You know, we start thinking, you start thinking from your own research into the the wars that are fought and how wars are fought, and you think, well, hang on a minute, there's a disconnect. And unfortunately, mm. that's the essence. That's why we do the podcast. We like to talk about war films and also look at them from a historical point of view and, and that happens and men at war isn't inherently an awful film no 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 i wouldn't i wouldn't say that at all it, it has some interesting sort of attempts to show combat fatigue shell shock it has some interesting attempts to show the interrelationship between officers and ncos when that breaks down definitely it's an interesting movie. It's probably just not carried off as well as it could have been. No. Because of the, some of the restraints of budget. Yeah. It would have been nice to have, been, have seen what Pentagon help might have helped, might have added. Mm. You know, they might have had the extra men for, you know, a swarm of North Koreans coming coming down on that hill and maybe maybe getting them to run away or something like that or having a few tanks and things like that might have really helped yeah. it. It's a long film, but it sort of mirrors their journey. I think that, you know, there's filmmaking elements that have been used to sort of prop up the things I don't have. I say it before in the pod, but it's using what you've got, not what you haven't. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true of this movie. Um, it has its positives. You know, there's there's nice scenes with tension. Yeah. There's some really nice cinematography work. Mm. Um, Ray and, and Ryan's performances are pretty solid. Yeah, they are actually. The supporting cast is, is pretty, you know, they're pretty good with the small amount of work that they're given. Yeah, Vic Vic Moreau does does a good job playing a, a show. Yeah, show the, the, the NCO that sort of loses it in the minefield is a little bit tropey. Yeah, a bit bit melodramatic, isn't it? Mine. Yeah, that, that's a little weak. 
Yeah. But um, I liked. Seeing... Yeah, I, I, it's definitely not. It's I, I watched it as a kid years ago. Same. And even then, I watched it and thought, "Wow, this is a lot of build up." And even as a kid, I thought, "I know that these films normally end with you know like a bit of action, you know, a climactic battle." So I thought, "Oh, this will this will be a really good one." Um, and then the ending is just kind of kind of not what you expect. And yeah. obviously, as you said earlier, that's probably what man and the screenplay was aiming for. One of the nice things as well is one, one of the positives to take from it is showing in the 50s, men were men, they were rugged, they smoked fags, you know, they had hard working jobs, they were rough, they were rugged. But this movie doesn't show that. It shows men as being scared, sick of sick of their environment, sick of war. Just wanting to go home. I thought that was quite refreshing. I like that. Yeah, and that 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 lives up to the Men in War title. Yeah, I think it does. So I think maybe that wraps up for this week. I think so. Yeah. I th- I think um, it's just one of those films that divided our opinion. Could have been better, but has some solid elements. You know, it's an interesting movie. If you got a couple of hours to kill, you could do worse. You could watch 2016's D Day. <laughs> Oh, God, no. Not again. <laughs> oh, that was terrible. Ooh. Uh... Oh, just Nick Cage is like, Nick Cage's son is like the fattest ranger colonel <laughs> in history. It's so bad. There's no words. There's no words for that movie. But yeah, we're, we're going to end up covering it. I can feel it. We will. Anyway, but in regards to Men in War, I think it's an important movie to sort of put into the context of other Korean War movies. For sure. I think is a, is a good way of thinking about it. Because it's attempting to do something which other movies of the period didn't do very often. No, there were there are other movies that did it, but or attempted it. But I think many more attempts to give a gritty and more sort of realistic yeah. representation of the mental stress that combat creates. Yeah, it's like Battleground in that respect, really, mm. isn't it? It's like something like akin to Battleground. And I think I think that's its strongest its strongest thing that is trying to show war in more of a, a more realistic way than the sort of gun-ho drive-in drive in movie, sort of B-movies you had at the time. Once you put it into the context of films like Porkchop Hill and Fixed Bayonets, yes. Hill and Career, then, you know, you have more of an idea of like where it sits in sort of the, the pantheon of Korean war movies. So, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to drop us a like, a subscription, turn on your notifications if you haven't already to make sure you always um, are alerted when we, we put out a new episode. And if you had varying opinions on Men in War, let us know via Twitter, at Fighting on Film. We really love hearing from you guys, so it's, that's one of the fun parts of doing the podcast. Yeah. So we love watching the movies, researching it, but I, we, I really do enjoy like chatting to people on Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, guys. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>